I'm going to pray, but now's the time to get the kids around the screen if the kids aren't there. I have something I want to share with the kids after I pray. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are God and that you are in control. Thank you, Father, that nothing surprises you in anything that has happened so far. And Father, we commit uh, ourselves to you. We commit this service time to you. Um, we pray for those who are watching, whether they're watching live at the moment or watching later. I pray that you would bless them, you would encourage them, and you would use our time together to be a blessing. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy and that you are ever faithful and that we can trust you no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids, I hope you are all around the screen and I have something I want to ask you. So, how many of you kids read the newspaper every day? Anybody? Okay, do you watch the news on TV every day? Anybody? Okay, maybe not the kids. What about your parents? Do your parents watch the news on TV? Do they read the newspaper? Um, maybe they're more likely to get it on their cell phone, right? And right now, it's even more important to know what's going on in the news. The news keeps us informed about things that are happening in Stratford and in Canada and around the world. Even people who never really follow the news very much, they're watching it right now because of this COVID-19 pandemic. And they want to know all the rules that we need to follow. They want to know what's going on and what we need to do to stay safe. And kids, we want, you want to know when it's time to get back to school, when you can meet up with your friends again. When can we go back to Sunday school or lunch pad again? So the news is really important. News is everywhere today. It's on our tablets, our smartphones, it's on the internet, all because of Wi-Fi, we're able to access the news in all kinds of places. And we don't have to wait for the morning newspaper anymore because that's yesterday's news. And we don't have to wait until the evening news anymore because that was this morning. We can get it all up to date right on our phones. But in Jesus' day, news traveled only by word of mouth. Now, what that means is I would see something happen and then I would go tell someone, I saw this happen. And then they would go tell someone else and they would say, Eva saw this happen. And then they would pass it on and it would take a long time for news to travel from one place to another. It could take weeks to get from Stratford to New Hamburg. It could take months to get from Stratford to Kitchener. It just took a long time because people walked or they rode donkeys or horses and it just took a long time to get news out there. Not like today. We can hear news as it's happening. But that is one thing that is really special about today's Bible story. Something that is so amazing is that the news spread really, really quickly. So let me tell you the story. So, first of all, we have a donkey. Okay, Jesus and his disciples went to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Jesus told two disciples to bring him a donkey. And he told them where to find it. Jesus got on the donkey, and he started to ride the donkey into Jerusalem. So he was still out of time when he started riding the donkey. But when he got to Jerusalem, a big crowd was there, and they welcomed him. People had palm branches that they had cut off trees, 
and they put them on the road in front of Jesus. How did all these people know so quickly that Jesus was coming? So this big crowd, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel. But the leaders in Jesus' day did not like Jesus. That picture's not changing. Did not like, uh, they saw how many people were following Jesus and they were angry about it and they decided to plot against Jesus because they didn't like it. They were jealous. So, the people didn't know that Jesus was coming for a special reason. You see, Jesus was on a secret mission. Not very many, nobody really knew what he was about to do by the end of the week. We know, looking back, we, we read in the Bible that Jesus was going to die and he was prepared to do that for us. And the people had no idea he was going to die. They were just really excited that he had come. And they wanted to see him. They wanted to praise him and welcome him. And one person at a time, the news had spread around Jerusalem that he was on his way. And it must have spread really quickly, which is really quite miraculous and surprising. But all the people had gathered and they had the palm trees, they took off their coats and they spread it on the ground and they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem. They didn't know he was on a secret mission. The people were shouting, Hosanna! It was a day of celebration. But you know what? Even better is next Sunday when we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead. So next Sunday is an even bigger celebration than today is. All of us have friends that don't go to church. We all know someone who needs to hear the good news about Jesus and that he loves them so much that he was willing to die for them. So why don't you take some time to think of your friends, maybe your friends in school or your neighbors, or maybe family members who don't know that Jesus can help them when they're scared or lonely or sad or sick. This is really, really good news. And on this very, on the very first Palm Sunday, the people shouted, Hosanna, which means save me. So pray for your friends and your family and the people who don't know Jesus, that they will get to know Jesus and that they will trust him and learn that he can care for them even in the middle of what's going on in the world today. I have a really special song I want to sing with you, okay? This is a song with lots of actions and I want everybody to stand up. Kids, get on your feet. Adults, why don't you get up as well? Even adults that don't have children in your house, there's nobody there to see you, okay? So just get up and do the actions and let's all celebrate together. Celebrate who Jesus is and if you do the actions, it will make you smile, I promise. Clap your hands.
Good job, everybody. Okay, before I go and let Pastor George come in and bring the message, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, what an amazing God you are. We get to worship you, we get to sing and praise you, and we thank you that you are always here. Be with all the kids. I pray you bless them, you'd encourage them. I pray that everybody has a smile on their face right now after that worship time together. And we pray that you would just open everybody's heart and mind to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So good to see all of you this morning, even if it is by faith. Uh, I recognize today that this isn't the way that I would choose to preach, and yet um, I know that there's some of you on the other end of that camera that you're, uh, you're worshiping along with us today, so praise the Lord for that. Um, I'm here. I've got <laughs> uh, one of the things that I'm uh, aware of as I'm uh, speaking to you this morning is that it's been quite a month. Uh, first of all, going to Florida, then having to come home early, and then two weeks of self-isolation. Uh, all of this has been just, uh, I, I, it, I couldn't have imagined this month had I tried. Uh, there's no way to predict something like this would happen. Anyway, it's so good to be back with you this morning, and I'm trusting today that as we share together that the Lord will speak to you. Um, that's the one thing that I have a great confidence in, regardless of our technology. Um, the technology is a tool, and our ability to speak, our ability for the God to use, his ability to use the things that we say, uh, that he will use it to his glory and praise, and in your hearts this morning, no matter where you are, no matter where you are. Uh, and uh, that is, that's a wonderful thing to remember today as we meet in this way. So today, Eva did, talked about Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. And as some of you may know it, Passion Week. And this is the day that we often celebrate in church. We wave the palm fronds. We consider the triumphal entry uh, of Jesus into Jerusalem that was celebrated by large crowds. And it frustrated the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. They were very much uh, unhappy with the course of events. And were this a year, like any other year, we would be celebrating in church. We'd be having the palm branches and the coats and we'd be singing Hosanna, but this is not a year like any other. And here's the challenge that we face. How do we remember and relearn the lessons of Palm Sunday, yet we do so in the context of a pandemic that is causing tremendous hardship in every place? Uh, so this morning, um, for those of you that are part and parcel of Elgin Missionary Church, I'm actually using uh, bits and pieces of a sermon I preached three years ago from the book of Habakkuk entitled, God Isn't Fair. And life isn't fair. And you see, the trouble with that is, of course, people seem to put the two together. And you may remember some of what I said then, but I believe it is worth hearing it again. And considering Palm Sunday and the title, Life Isn't Fair, it may seem a bit of a stretch to think of these two things, of these things together. Bear with me this morning, bear with me today, and we will see that there is a correlation between Habakkuk and his experience and Jesus as he stood before Jerusalem on, on that Palm Sunday. So in times of tragedy and crisis, some people are asking questions like, where's God? Why doesn't he do anything about restraining this? Um, and you know, those are good questions. Um, this COVID-19 pandemic that we in this world are experiencing is a tremendous challenge. And some may wonder why God would have caused this or authored it or permitted it. Some wonder if this disease is a sign of Jesus' imminent return. So 
I want to be clear about a few things as we start this morning, and uh, it's, it's not a bad thing for me to talk about this, considering where we are. So is God the author of this disease? And the answer to that question is no. Um, there are two places in the scriptures where you do find that God has authored disease. And the first place is in uh, Numbers 11, verse 33, where the people are in rebellion. And God allows or permits or authors a disease that is an act of judgment upon their rebellion. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30, we find that the people of the church had been taking rather um, a very passive or uh, the wrong view of the Lord's Supper. And the, Paul tells them that's the reason that some of them are sick. But generally speaking, is God the author of disease? No, he's not. Disease is a consequence of living in a broken world. It's broken by sin. And today we are reaping that. It's coming into our lives. The second question that we ask, did God permit it? Permit this disease? And then the, the answer to that question is, in a way, yes. In that he allows sin to bear fruit. Can God limit it? Can God limit this disease? Uh, this COVID-19, and I would suggest that we need to pray because the answer is yes. So the next question is, does God have a purpose in allowing this sin to bear fruit? Uh, the sin of disease, the sin of illness, the, the sin of things bad, uh, that happened to good people that they didn't deserve. Um, does God have a purpose in allowing sin to bear fruit? And the answer again is yes. It is concluding that we need God's grace. We need it personally. We need it corporately. We need it globally found in Jesus. That would be a good consequence. If as a consequence, people are coming to the, to the senses that, you know, there's more to this life than just what I'm experiencing right now. And I ache, we ache, with everyone that's lost a job or income or health or a loved one to this disease. And as a church, we really do attempt to be there for all of these people. But then we ask God, let your purposes be made true. May they come to pass. Another question that people may have is this, is this a sign of Jesus' imminent return? Well, of course it is. No and yes. It is, uh, I would not want to say that Jesus is going to return next week or in two weeks' time or next month or next year or in two years' time. But just as both world wars and the Spanish flu were signs that we live in the last days, so is COVID-19. Um, it's, it's a sign of the times that we live in. And it ought to be an opportunity for us to trust in God during these days. Uh, it, 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 it helps us recognize, just as was forecast, Jesus himself said there'll be wars, rumors of wars, famine and disease and all sorts of things, and yet the end is yet to come. And people are still asking, however, where is God? In the midst of this pandemic, where is God? You see, now considering Palm Sunday that Eva described so well with the children's story, nobody was asking that question. Um, no one was asking that question. Everyone that had gathered along that road to Jerusalem celebrated that God had brought his Messiah, Jesus, to bring freedom and liberation from the Roman oppressors. Everybody was going, this is an act of God. And they were happy about it. Here was the man who had promised, who had been promised by the prophets and so many others over the years and years of history. They had pinned their hopes on him, on Jesus. And the only one that day who was aware of his destiny was Jesus himself. Even with the adulation of the crowd swirling around him, the praises of children, the singing of Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The waving of palm fronds, uh, even as he experienced all of this, as he came to Jerusalem, what did Jesus do? 
it says that he wept. He wept. Because only Jesus knew the consequences of that journey, of his arrival. He didn't come to be crowned as an earthly king. He came as a sacrifice for sin. If you take a look at Luke chapter 19, verses 41 and 44, you will find that those things happened. Jesus, Jesus cried as he came into Jerusalem. Because the next week would now be the most challenging of Jesus' life. He cried not for himself, but he cried for the people that he came to. And so I suppose if anyone had a problem with fairness, it would have been Jesus. If anyone could have cried out, this isn't fair, it would have been Jesus. Uh, Jesus was welcomed as a king. He could have had anything. And yet he knew very much that that uh, week was going to result in his death and sacrifice for sin. And so now here we have a connection between Habakkuk and Palm Sunday. Habakkuk said, life's not fair. By association, God's not fair. Likewise, Jesus could have easily echoed that same sentiment. He could have very easily said, this is not fair. Let's go to the book of Habakkuk. And if you have your Bibles there in your homes, would you please turn to it? It's one of those really small Bible, Bible uh, books. Uh, it's between, uh, let me see, Nahum and Zephaniah. It's one of those really small ones at the end of the Old Testament. And um, we find, as we take a look at Habakkuk, he says to God, why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you acting? Why are these things occurring? And there's Habakkuk's protest. In verses one, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it says, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice and you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Uh, Habakkuk's looking at his society and he's saying to himself, this isn't good. Uh, this is not good. And he's saying, God, you're not listening to me. You're not paying attention to me. Uh, wickedness is thriving. I am disgusted. Where are you in this? And there are people that I'm sure are saying the very same things about the disease that we're experiencing today. This, this just isn't right. It's not right. Where are you in this? And, and uh, there's violence, conflict, injustice, uh, bribery. And then God's answer. <laughs> God's answer is amazing. Because God answers Habakkuk by using this word, I'm sending Babylonians. Now, for those of you that are unaware of this, Babylonians were the arch enemies of the Israelites. And the uh, societal uh, problems that they were experiencing in Israel, God was saying to these, to these people, I'm going to send the Babylonians. They're your arch enemies. And uh, they're going to come. In verses 5 to 11, he says, I'm raising them up. They're a ruthless and impetuous people. They sweep across the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They're feared and dreaded. They're a lot of themselves. They're going to come. They're going to sweep past like the wind. They're going to be people who will come and they will take you captive. There's going to be a ruling that will come. It'll help in uh, dealing with your society ills. <laughs> and of course... Habakkuk goes, Babylonians? You're using our enemies to discipline us. How can that be, God? How can you do this? That's not fair. That's not right. They're worse than we are. Don't you know, God? In verses, uh, uh, verse 12 through to chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, God, don't you really know? They're worse than we are. They're wicked and they're treacherous. They worship their own strength and ability. God, you've made a mistake. This can't be. How can you do this? Um, and in chapter 2 and verse 1, we find Habakkuk saying some very interesting, he knows he's protested, maybe a bit too much. 
And then he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, I will stand at my watch, station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what God will say to me, what answer I'm going to give to this complaint. Not what God is going to give to this complaint, but what I'm going to have to answer to. And then God says, I want you to write this down. That, that's actually quite interesting. God says, I don't want you just to remember this. So pick up a pen, pick up a piece of paper. I don't want you to miss any of this. I want you to write this down. Put it down, okay? This is what's going to happen. And he says, the Babylonians will get theirs. If you take a look at chapter... Th- in chapter uh, 2, verses 2 to 20, the Babylonians, they themselves will be judged. But that will take some time. It's not going to happen immediately. It won't take place right away. But it's going to be a while. And then he says, there's five woes that I want you to consider. Five things that you're going to have to continue to remember. Number one, in your society, woe to those who steal for their day of reckoning is coming. Woe to those who think that they're immune to punishment. And that's in verse 9. In verse 12, it says, Woe to those who exploit, exploit the labor of others for their gain. Woe to those who live in immorality and violence. Verse 15. Woe to those who worship an idol and not the living God. Um... God is basically spelling out to the society of these Israelites that this is the reasoning behind his act of judgment. And finally, by bringing the Babylonians, and finally, Habakkuk, you need to give some thought to whom you're speaking. Um, you'll find that at, at, the, at the end of chapter 2. You really need to give some thought as to whom you're speaking. And uh, that's, verse 20, that's actually uh, a good reminder at times for all of us when we get complaining. Verse 20, it says, this is what the Lord says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Habakkuk? You've complained a bit too much. And now is the time that you have to learn what I'm planning on doing. So what what do we find as we look at that? Habakkuk writes a psalm, a song of praise. And he starts in verse 3, chapter 3 and verse 1. And this time, instead of protesting, instead of complaining, he prays. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk. And now, God, I recognize who you are. In verses 1 to 15, he remembers the Lord. He says, I've heard of your fame. In verse 2, I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God, that's my prayer right now. I remember who you are. I know, God, who you are. And down to verse, the end of verse 15, he recognizes God. He talks about what God has done. And then in verse 16, he trembles. Verse verse 16, Habakkuk says, I heard my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept in my bones and my legs trembled. Does that not sound like someone who's afraid? It does. You know, and I think at at times we we tell people, uh, faith not fear, um, that fear fear and faith are... Uh, oppositional, they shouldn't be in the same place. But you know, there are times when fear does come. Fear of what may be. Fear of what will be. And Habakkuk trembles because he knows how difficult those days will be. I heard my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones, my legs trembled. You ever had that happen? I've had that happen. There's days when you're anxious about things and you you wonder what's going to come and and, uh, your stomach gets upset and you feel really uh, just on edge. Habakkuk trembled. And then he does something pretty amazing. 
At the end of verse 16, he says, Yet I wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. And, and these words, for me, are words that resonate with me. Because Habakkuk says, this is what I'm going to do, though the fig tree doesn't bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And uh, as I look at those verses, I'm, I'm aware that the, the Lord has produced a response in Habakkuk and it's a journey. He was a, he's a disturbed prophet. <laughs> and yet, in terms of his dealing with the situation he found himself in, he came to a place of saying, God, I'm yours. Though these things occur, I'm still yours. I will rejoice in the Lord. There is something about being a Christian, truly understanding what that means, that brings dignity to us. Dignity to humanity. And I see Habakkuk experiencing and expressing this very same thing, that he's trusting in God. In verse 19, it goes on a little more. And he says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Habakkuk is an honest and revealing dialogue between a man and God. And... Uh, we're reading more than a journal entry. It's more than just a journal entry that somehow has become part of our public domain. Habakkuk represents the faithful Israelite, the one who has call, walked with God sincerely. He's honorably done so, and yet he's confused. He says, what am I seeing? What is all this? Because you're not really seeing God at work. You're not sensing that things are going to be redeemed. And this message is really for someone today who struggles with injustice and the fact that this world does not seem right and yet they walk with God. This message is for the person who's struggling with the pandemic of COVID-19 and wonders, why? Why? This message is for the one who wonders why Jesus, a man who loved children, who stood up to injustice and religious legalism, who attracted people from all walks of life, and particularly those who were not the most reputable, he taught the crowds. He did miracles that revealed the grace and the power of God. And a week later, he was on a cross. Why? He who was welcomed as king, crucified on the cross less than a week later. He didn't deserve to die, and yet he did. And here is an example of unmatched unfairness. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 10 to 12 gives us these words. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord and the Lord though the Lord makes his life an offering of sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. And therefore, God says, I will give him, his son, a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death, was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You see, as we take a look at these things this morning, we realize these things that life isn't fair. To equate God with life is also unfair. And the purposes of God are being worked out. We often do not see or understand the larger picture. 
We read a book, again in the book of Isaiah, not just in Isaiah 53, but Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Today is Palm Sunday, and we ask the question, why? Jesus loved children. He stood up to the injustice. Why did he go to the cross? And we find, as I've just read from Isaiah 55, uh, 53, these things that are occurring, but also in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Let me just conclude with that. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The responses that God is looking for in this day, that he looked for from his son, and that he looks for from us, is first of all trust. Trust that God has these things in his hand, to submit to his desires and his will, to worship him. May, as we go through these days, our response be likewise. Let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning that as we come into your presence, that God, we can know these things with an assurance. You are God. You are the one that cares for us. And even in the midst of difficult and challenging days, you've not changed. And at times, Father, we do wonder, where, where is God in this? Where are you, God, in the midst of a situation we're experiencing? And Father, you come back with your word and you say, I've always been here. I will continue to lead you. And in the midst of this situation, could you continue to worship me? Father, your desire is that we would be your people and that these experiences in life would shape us, transform us, and make us, God, your own. Faith, Father, is never formed in the light. It's always formed in the dark. And as we consider the, the way that you're forming faith in us today, regardless of what we see or experience, we trust you. May that be the thing that each of us say on this day. I bless you, Father, for who you are. I ask God that you would go with us through this week, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. May God bless you, and I look forward to coming together with you again um, using this media. Uh, bless the Lord. Amen.